Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, always good to get together and see everyone. Phil and Lisa, thanks for your sponsorship. Nice to see everybody here. Malcolm, it's nice to see you, Malcolm. And uh, Michael Gross, nice to see you here. Leanne, all our regulars. Always nice to see Dina. Dina's here, one of our uh, staunch regulars. We have quite a few, of course, Family March, obviously, Pillars of the Shia. Very nice to see you. Um, okay, um, first of all, I'd like to speak maybe a little bit about Yom Yerushalayim. We're still really in the uh, Isru Chag of, of Yom Yerushalayim, a day of uh, immense uh, significance for all of us, um, especially those of us who actually live in Yerushalayim and who've uh, uh, given up uh, life in Chutzlaret in order to be able to live in Yerushalayim. Certainly, uh, I would say the most wonderful and significant uh, matana gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given to our generation is uh, to be able to access Yerushalayim and live in Yerushalayim and benefit from the light and the beauty uh, of, this amazing, uh, of this amazing place. Maybe I'd like to just share with you for a minute, for a minute or two a personal recollection of mine of, of uh, um, this day, uh, the Yom Yerushalayim, 54 years ago. Uh, I think most of the people in this year um, will remember 1967. Um, I was a young teenager and uh, living with my parents in London. And my parents uh, were you know, Holocaust survivors and uh, had lost most of their family and uh, were living in London, but I'd always dreamt of coming to live in Eretz Israel. Uh, for various Parnassah reasons, one thing and another, it hadn't worked out, but they were always dreaming of coming to live in Israel. And on that day in 1967, um, I think it was the 5th of June, 6th of June, um, they were sitting, we were sitting looking at uh, the BBC on the television, a, a black and white television. Anybody here remember black and white televisions? Uh, <laughs> we were sitting and watching a black and white television, the BBC, yes, a very massive television with a small screen, and um, uh, the the uh, the um, and what we're watching, of course, Israel had a policy in the first few days of the war not to give out any information at all. All BBC had was the Egyptian propaganda films, and if you remember. Uh, NASA, uh, NASA was um, putting out uh, fake news. He, he created some films of, of, of Egyptian troops marching through Tel Aviv. Is there something wrong with the uh, picture? Something wrong with the, the transmission, Ellie? No, no, we, we hear you, we see you. I'm trying to uh, um, convert this to a highlight. I'm gonna remove the spotlight completely. It's, it's fine. As it is now, it's fine, as far as I'm concerned. If, if, you're, seeing, if you're seeing me, then that's good. Yeah, we're not so, seeing speakers. So what's happening is my parents are watching <coughs> this propaganda film. Two things remained in my mind was the, the image of the Egyptian troops marching through Tel Aviv, and the port of Haifa was up in flames. And there were other things as well. Some of you might remember that. And uh, my parents... My parents, who were not overly emotional people, uh, were sitting there crying. And they were crying and they said, look, we had this dream to go and live in Israel, but the dream is over. And you must understand, it was like just uh, 20 years after the Holocaust, and it seemed like another terrible destruction had taken place. And, this, um, and, and, that's, and that's what the BBC was showing as news. Of course, what happened was, so two interesting, thing happen, two interesting things happened because of this film. The first interesting thing was, and of course, within a few days, uh, my parents, we all found out the actual real truth, which was uh, so wonderful, almost hard to believe, that Israel had not only uh, been victorious, but the victory of the 67 war sounded like a, 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 a victory of, of biblical proportions. Um, that uh, the, 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 the way in which it had taken place so swiftly and so amazingly. But the second, the second result of these films was something much more significant. Well, the first thing was that my parents, of course, because of this, because of their sadness and then their subsequent simcha, decided to come on Aliyah. And in 1969, my parents came on Aliyah and uh, came to live in Israel, and was able to spend the last uh, 40 years of their life uh, living in Israel. Uh, but it was triggered off 
by the 67 war. And um, that was, uh, so that was one very important uh, uh, consequence from my personal point of view. But from Am Yisrael point of view, what had happened was, some of you might be aware of this, but I see this as an amazing moment of Hashkacha of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There were so many moments of Hashkacha, so many moments of direct intervention of the hand of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the 67 war. But the most amazing thing was that NASA was willing to put out these films and, he, and, and send them to Hussein in Jordan, and he lied to him, <clears throat> and he lied to Hussein, and he said, look, right. I'm, sure. I'm on board. I'll tell you in a minute. What did he say? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, that they, that he said to him, come, we will, drink, we will drink coffee together in Tel Aviv, Nasser said to Hussein, because we're winning, why, why should you lose out? Because until then, and Jordan had stayed out of the war. Israel to told Jordan, if you stay out of the war, if you stay out of the war, we won't attack you. That was the, that was the deal that Israel made with Jordan. And therefore there was no front. There was just a, thank you very much. There was only a Northern and a Southern front, but there wasn't a central a battle against, uh, against Jordan. And Jordan. But once Nasser lied to Hussein and, 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 fought, and conned him basically, he duped him into thinking that the, that the he, I mean, NASA knew that his whole air force had been destroyed already. NASA knew there was no hope of him being, being victorious. And he schlepped Hussein into the war. And because Hussein, listen to this, because Hussein came into the war on the back of these fake news films, because of that, in the end, we got back Yerushalayim and Yehuda and Shamran, which we wouldn't have got in the 67 war had Jordan not joined in the battle. Into Jordan, had Jordan not joined in, we wouldn't have been able to take over the old city of Yerushalayim or the Kotel or, the, or, or Yehuda and Shamran. It was only because HaKadosh Baruch had put into the mind of NASA to, to, to fool, to try and dupe his, so to speak, colleague Hussein. And he, he, drew, he, drew, him, he drew him into a hopeless war. And because of that, we got Yerushalayim and... Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and, and Yehuda and Shabram. And if you read the account, I was reading a few years ago some of the account of a fellow called Uzi Narkis. Some of you might, uh, the name might be a bit familiar to some of you. Uzi Narkis was the man who was um, Aluf um, Pikud Merkaz. In other words, he was in charge of all military operations in the center of Israel. The North was fighting Syria, the South was fighting Egypt, and in the center, nothing was supposed to happen because Jordan was supposed to stay out of the war. Suddenly Jordan came into the war and Uzi Narkis had a war on his hands for which he didn't really have many battle plans. He certainly hadn't planned to capture Yerushalayim. There was certainly no intention at all. Uh, um, to cap if some of you might have read the book Prime Ministers by Yehuda Avner, magnificent, a magnificent read. So he, he takes you through what the amazing things that happened then that out of the blue, suddenly they said, look, we have a, wi a window of opportunity, less than 24 hours. If we don't capture Yerushalayim now, we're finished. <laughs> and not everybody agreed to do that. But, but in, in, in a matter of, of, of a few hours, they put together battle plans to capture Yerushalayim. And uh, unfortunately, the battle plans were not so fantastic. And because of that, unfortunately, sadly, lots of the Chayalim were killed because they hadn't really planned to capture Yerushalayim at all. They hadn't planned it. Uzi Narkis himself only knew how to do this because he'd already tried to do it in 1948. He was already a commander in 1948. And now so basically he was coming back 19 years later to finish up the job. So what's interesting is an amazing moment of Ashkocha Protis. HaKadosh Baruch who put it into NASA's mind to draw Jordan into a hopeless war. HaKadosh Baruch in order to give us this gift of Yerushalayim, Irak Kodesh, and of course, plus Yehud and Shavron. And uh, because of that, all, all out of his own ego and his own uh, miscalculations, uh, the, the end result was that we have now for 54 years, and Be'ezus Hashem, Ad Soif Kal Hadorus, we will have uh, uh, Yerushalayim, uh, Irak Kodesh, under, under a, a Jewish, uh, Jewish sovereignty. Uh, as you know, the last 24 hours have not been great uh, in terms of our conflict with the Arabs. Uh, but even that might be the hand of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because it seems to be that the people trying to put together a government at the moment were seriously considering bringing the Arabs into the government. But now the Arabs have said, so long as this hostilities are going on, we can't even consider and even talking to you. 
So it might be that their time will run out to make a government um, without the Arabs. They can't possibly bring the Arabs in now uh, that they even wanted to do it in the first place is to me such an act of total utter lunacy. I can't even understand it, but, but these hostilities these hostilities have the result that, that the, the Arabs can't sit down even and talk uh, with uh, uh, the new group of people trying to form a, uh, an anti-Bibi government. Okay, all that is not the subject of my Shia and I'm not qualified as a political commentator anyway. Um, so let's learn a little bit of Torah together. Uh, but I think um, the, the, uh, the topic for the first half of the Shia anyway, I'd like to look at uh, Yerushalayim. Just one second. My wife decided I needed a cup of coffee this morning in order to get this shit going. So a cup of coffee appeared here on my desk miraculously. Not sure how it arrived, but there it is. Um, some of the miraculous uh, uh, creations of, of my wife in the house, things happen um, without my understanding how they came to be, but that's, uh, that, that's, that's the normal, normal course of events. Okay. Let's have a look at Yerushalayim. I'd like to share with you a, a, a couple of ideas about the beauty of Yerushalayim through the eyes of, of the Tanakh and through the eyes of Chazal. Just a few points. Of course, one could speak for hours and days about Yerushalayim. Let me just start off by saying it's an interesting fact that the word Yerushalayim doesn't appear anywhere in the Chumash. It appears in Nach hundreds of times. But in the Chumash, it, appear, it doesn't appear anywhere. Uh, but, there is never, but there is in the text of the Chumash a word, one word, which is used as a sort of a code word for Yerushalayim. Anybody know what that is? What is the code word that the Torah uses when it wants to refer to Yerushalayim, but it doesn't want to say the name Yerushalayim? What is it? Malkitzedek, Salim. Um, okay, yeah. there is a connection to Monkey Tedek Melech Shalei, but that's only mentioned once. But there is a word which is mentioned repeatedly in the Torah. Yeah, rare. And that is the term ha ma -kom. Oh. Ha ma -kom. The place. For example, when the Torah wants to tell us about Aliyah Laregel, it says, Shalosh Poem Bashano, Yerokel Zachurcho, right? Ha ma -kom ha -ma -kom. The place. The place that I can remember when it speaks about establishing the Sanhedrin on the Harabayas, it says, that Yerushalayim is not just a place, but it is the place, right? The, the specific place, Hamakom. And indeed, so for example, uh, we have a Masaira in, in, in Chazal that Avram Avinu did the Akeda on Har Hamuria, which was Har Habayas. But the, but the Posuk there uh, in uh, 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 the Posuk, right in 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 in, in, uh, in Vayero, which speaks about the Akeda, doesn't mention Yerushalayim at all because Yerushalayim, the word Yerushalayim doesn't appear. But it says that Avram Avinu is going to Har Hamaria Vayar et Hamakom Meirachok. He saw Hamakom, and the Hamakom is always uh, Yerushalayim. Similarly, it's Similarly, a Yaakov, when he lies down and has the dream of the Malachim going up and down, it says, Vayifka bamakom He came to the place. Now, of course, everyone also understands that the word hamakom has a dual meaning. Hamakom mm -hmm. also means what? It also means HaKadosh Baruch Hamakom Yenachem Eschem is a reference to the Rebbeinu Shlela, right? Hamakom is a manifestation of the Shechina. Right, as somebody has just texted to me straight away. So Hamakom has got this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, dub double nuance that it means the place of all of all the locations in the world. It is the place, and secondly, it is also the place of the the Shechina, the presence of the Shechina more than anywhere else. But the word Yerushalayim doesn't appear there. Why it doesn't appear there? Subject for a separate Shia. Kliyaka speaks about it. The Medrash speaks about it. The Rambam Mimur Nevuchim speaks about it. What exactly might have been the reason not to give the word the name Yerushalayim? But throughout the whole of the Sefer Yehoshua and Sefer Shoftim, the Jewish people are living in Israel. Nobody knows yet 
where it is located. Nobody yet knows where that place is going to be. No one's got any idea. Meanwhile, the Mishkan is in Gilgal, it's in Shiloh, the Mishkan's moving around, but they haven't yet, they haven't reached what the Possum refers to as El Hamanuchov El Hanachalo. In other words, they haven't reached the final destination yet. So who is the first person to identify Yerushalayim as the capital of Israel and the Mokham HaMikdash? So that is David HaMelech. David HaMelech, and not immediately either. David HaMelech, when he's crowned king, he's not crowned king in Yerushalayim. He's crowned king in Hebron. And only after being seven years in Hebron, he decides, right, now's the time to go to Yerushalayim and capture Yerushalayim and, and, and declare it as ha Ma -kom. So David Amelech really is the instigator of, of Yerushalayim. Now it's true, as I mentioned before, that already at the time of Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu lays the foundations of Yerushalayim at the Akeda. When he does the Akeda on the Harabayis, so there the Apostle there says, Vayikra Avram, Hashem HaMokim HaHu, Hashem Yireh. Hashem Yeomah HaYom, Bahar Hashem Yeroeh. So Yir e and Yeroe means to see and to be seen, right? So Avram Avinu says, this spot where I've just done the Akeda, that will be for all future generations the place where mankind will be able to see HaKadosh Baruch Hu and be seen by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yir e, Yeroe. And in fact, the Torah uses that word with Aliyah Laregel. Sholosh Pa'omim Bashano Yeroe Kol Zechurchos Pnei Hashem. Yeru Air means you go there to be seen. Be seen in that sense, meaning to report for duty, to report to Akarish Baruch Hu at the Harabayis, and that is the 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 the, the origin of Yerushalayim. So David Amelach is the one who identifies and establishes a Yerushalayim. But we all know that when David Amelach says to Akarish Baruch Hu, and now it's time to build the base of Mikdash, the answer is no. You're not allowed to do it. Only your son. Shlomo HaMelech will be able to build the base. Why exactly David was not allowed to build the base Amikdash is a bit of a mystery, frankly. If you look at different Mephorshim, different Gemaras, etc., in, in, Sefer, in Sefer Shemuel, there's no indication at all why he wasn't allowed to. In Divrei Hayomim, it says, because you fought so many battles and spilt so much blood, therefore you can't be the builder of the base Amikdash which in itself is problematic. No one really understands that completely. All the Mephoshim explain, what do you mean David spilled blood? David fought Milchomo Hashem. He fought battles against the enemies of Klal Yisrael. That's not considered spilling blood. He was defending us against our enemies. So why, why should that disqualify him from building a base of Mikdash? It's a little bit of a mystery. Again, subject for a different shia. But one thing is clear, that David HaMelech on the one hand didn't build the base of Mikdash, on the other hand, in his mind, the vision that one day there will be a Beis HaMikdash was very alive and very real. And I'd like to just learn with you now a few words out of Tehillim and see what Chazal say about these words, which really relate to exactly this sentiment and this idea. So let's just share the screen for a second. No, that didn't work. Bear with me for one second, Rabbi Isai. Bear with me, please. Second. Now let's try that again. Right. Okay. Do we see can we see a text? Yes? Good. Excellent. So this is one of the Shir Hamalas, nine Psukim. So as you know, there are 15 Shir Hamalas which later on was corresponding to the 15 steps going up uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Ezra Snoshim into the, uh, into the place of the Beis HaMikdash, the Harabais. Let's just learn a little bit together some of, this, some of these Pesukim. So the Pesuk starts off as follows, Shir HaMalas LeDovid, Somachti BaOmrim Li Beis HaShem Neilech, which means I, I rejoice whenever people tell me Beit HaShem Neilech that we are going to go to the Beit Hashem. In other words, I rejoice every time people talk to me about the plans and the intention to build a Beit Hashem, to build a Beit HaMikdosh. 
right? David Amarach is only really relating to the plans, to the neilech, to the aspiration to build the base of Ektosh, which he never saw in his life. He says, Omdos hoyu raglenu bisharayich Yerushalayim. We are already standing at the gate of Yerushalayim. In other words, we, we already have Yerushalayim in our hands. We have sovereignty over the Harabayas, but we can't yet build a base Hamikdash, but we've already got Yerushalayim. So he, David, is accredited as, uh, 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 with the foundation of Yerushalayim, Irak Kodesh, before there was uh, a, a, a base Hamikdash. And then the third posseg is the one I, look at, I want to look at a bit more carefully. The posseg says, Yerushalayim habanuya. Now this is a very interesting word for us as well, right? Because for us, for you, so Yerushalayim is a place where we already have in Jewish sovereignty. But what we daven for, what we daven for is Yerushalayim habanuya. Yerushalayim habanuya means Yerushalayim which is built up. It doesn't mean skyscrapers or shopping centers. It means built up with the base of Mikdash. Yerushalayim Habanuya, right? So when we say the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, we should always say, if we want to be precise, we should say the Shana Habab Yerushalayim Habanuya, not Yerushalayim Habi Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim we've got already. We're davening the Shana Habab Yerushalayim Habanuya, and that phrase Yerushalayim Habanuya comes from this Tehillim Kufkaf Beis, David Hamelech. He says, what I'm looking forward to is Yerushalayim when it's fully built. And here comes an interesting phrase I want to look at a bit more carefully. Ke'ir, ke'ir shechubro lo yachdov. Now this, this phrase really captures something about the unique qualities um, of Yerushalayim. But the key word here is chubra, right? Chubra comes from the word chibur. Chibur means... Um, a connection, an attachment, things which are connected to each other, right? Mechubarim, right? Mechubarim means to be connected, right? And the uh, Yerushalayim is a city, Shechubra la yachtov, which is connected to it, very yachtav together. In other words, it creates a, a yichud, it creates a, a connection, a oneness, but it doesn't say with what. What, what is this chibur that Yerushalayim is able to create? That is the question I'd like to look at for the next few minutes. That this, this word chubro lo yachtov is a mafteach, is the key to understanding something a little bit. Today we're going to scratch the surface of the unique kedusha of Yerushalayim, but it's contained in this word, the word chubro lo yachtov. If you have a chance later on, any of you to take out your Tanakh and look up to Hillim, Perik Kufkaf Beis, and look at some of the Mofroshim. It's a very interesting subject. I'm going to introduce you to one or two interpretations. What does it mean, Chubro lo Yachtov? So I'm going, the first Pshat is simply the Pshat of these Psukim. And the Pshat is, if you look at the next Pasuk, David HaMelech already, so you must understand, David HaMelech has got Yerushalayim. He doesn't have the base of Mikdash. But in this Mizmor, he's in the middle of a vision. He's, an, he's, he's anticipating the beauty of a Yerushalayim HaBnuyo, which has the power of the Chibur. Where is this Chibur manifested? Look at the next Pasuk. Shesham Olu Shavotim Shivteka. Because there, Olu, the word Alu comes from the word Aliyah, right? And it's a reference to Aliyah Laregel, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, the whole of Klal Yisrael come together on Aliyah Laregel. And he mentions here Shvotim, the tribes. He should have said Sham Alu Bnei Yisrael. Why the Shvotim? So anybody who's read the book of Yoshua and Shoftim will know that the Shvotim were not really living together peacefully. The tribes, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Yehudi, Yisachar, they were at odds with each other. There were lots of flashpoints. There were lots of disputes. There was a fair amount of hostility. Even one or two civil wars took place between the Shvatim. But the Shvatim needed to be unified into one nation, right? In the book of Shoftim, for example, in a couple of places, the Possek says, Bayomim Hoheim, on those days, Ein Melech Bi Yisrael. 
there is no king of Israel who is able to unite everybody. Ish kol hayosho ba'enov yase. Each tribe and each person does his own thing. Everybody does it his own way, and therefore there's no unity. So David HaMelech is saying, you know what's going to happen? Yerushalayim is going to be built. Shesham olu shavotim shivteka. The shavotim are going to come on Aliyah Laregel, and, and what's going to happen? Edus li Yisrael. And they are going to testify that they are all part of Yisrael. They're all part of Israel. They're all part of one nation. Lahodos l'shem Hashem. When they get together to daven to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Yerushalayim, it will have the power of doing what? Of uniting Klal Yisrael. So the first, if we ask the question, what does it mean, Chubro lo yachtav? Answer number one is, it's mechaber together, all of Klal Yisrael. The Klal Yisrael are united. Yerushalayim has the power to unite Klal Yisrael. I don't think it's a secret that throughout Jewish history, the Jewish people were very rarely united with internal peace, right? Uh, sadly, uh, Jewish history is full of um, various different internal uh, uh, hostilities and 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 resentments and 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 machlekesim. and uh, sadly this continues uh, to this day, right? The way in which different groups and different parties and different and different uh, uh, dot different communities uh, are at odds with each other is one of the sadnesses of of Jewish existence. But David Amalek says that Yerushalayim contains the mafteach the key to solving this problem, that once Yerushalayim is functioning properly, what we can look forward to is achdut, unity within Klal Yisrael. In fact, in Pasha's Buchu Kosai, there's an interesting line about that, that the, uh, uh, the Pasha we just read, um, that in the, few op- the first few psukim of Buchu Kosai, so the Pasha speaks about an idyllic, uh, situation or adaftem as oivechem nasati gishmechem biitam and you'll have and you'll have all the good evidence is nasati shaloim baoretz. So what does it mean nasati shaloim baoretz? It doesn't mean peace from your enemies because it, because the pasuk says or adaftem as oivechem but not you'll already be victorious against all your enemies. What does what does it mean you'll have shalom? So the Ibn Ezra says one word one word in the Ibn Ezra. It says, Vnisati Shalom Ba'oret, says the Ibn Ezra, Beinei Chen. He says, the Shalom referred to here is internal peace between different communities, different individuals. And peace for Klal Yisrael doesn't mean that we all agree with each other on everything. It means that despite the fact that we see things differently, we live together peacefully. David HaMelech in this Mizmor is saying that Yerushalayim has the power, Shechubro lo Yachtov, to connect people together because it can unite Klal Yisrael. Klal Yisrael, all the Shvotim come together and they united. They are united by the fact that there is one Beis HaMikdosh and they're all davening together and that gives them a, a transcendent uh, a purpose in life which goes beyond all the different internal squabblings and, diff- and differences of opinion. And that, that is the unity. And the second Pasuk is and that also Yerushalayim will be the place of the Sanhedrin. In other words, it won't only be a unity in terms of davening and Pesach Shavuos and Sukkos, but it'll be a unity in terms of the administration of the law and of the Torah, and the ultimate, ultimate Torah is going to come from Yerushalayim as, as one single authority. So all these are unifying uh, features, and you can see in the posseg that that's the underlying theme because it goes on to say of the famous posseg that we know, Laman achai v'rei'ai adabra no sholoi bach. Famous uh, posseg, um, I think I've mentioned before, whenever I say a famous posseg in, Tana- in Tanakh, the only famous psukim in Nach are the, are the, are the songs. Uh, if, if a posseg is made into a song, right, then it's famous. If it isn't made into a song, it's only a uh, known uh, to, uh, uh, to Tanakh enthusiasts. Anyhow, but you can see here, just to sum up here for one second, 
that David Amelech is saying currently it's all we've got Abish Arayich. We only have the gates of Yerushalayim, in other words, the control of Yerushalayim. But he's looking forward to Yerushalayim Habanuya, and it will have the power Shechubra Lo Yachtov, which unite everybody. Because and the result will be that Klal Yisrael will be Achai Vereai, brothers and friends. And in fact, I found an interesting line in the Yerushalmi. Can you see here the Talmud Yerushalmi uh, in Masechus Chagig is Omer Bishur Ben Levi. So Bishur Ben Levi is commenting on this pasuk Yerushalayim Habenuyot Yisrael Chubur Lo Yaktov. So look look at this phrase that he says here. What is special about Yerushalayim? It's the city that makes all of Klal Yisrael chaverim. And you must understand the word chaverim is a play on the words shechubro lo yachtov. The word chaver is the same Hebrew word as chibur, as connection. So the whole of the Jewish people will become chaverim through Yerushalayim. Okay, so that's the first pshat, uh, Rabbi Sai. When we look forward to Yerushalayim Habanuya, why is it very significant to us? For lots of reasons, of course. But one of the main significant reasons is that David Amalek promises us that it has the segula, it has the power to uh, unite the whole of Klal Yisrael and, and make them a, a chaverim together. Um, that's the first pshat. The second pshat is here in the Gemara, uh, the Gemara in Tainus, uh, Daf hey. So the Gemara actually asks this question, and the Gemara says as follows: "On the Rabbi Yochanan, and somebody told me this has also been made into a song, although it's a song that I don't know. On the Rabbi Yochanan, on my Hakadosh Baruch Hu, loy ovoi biYerushalayim shel Mala, ad she ovoi liYerushalayim shel Mata." Here, the the uh, um, Chazal introduce us to the idea. That, that there is there are two Yerushalayims. It says Yerushalayim shall malo, that in some sense there is a Yerushalayim that exists fully developed and fully built, but it exists in the Olam HaElyon. It exists in the spiritual worlds, right? Yerushalayim shall mata is the Yerushalayim we are familiar with, which is not yet, right? Uh, the Yerushalayim shall, shall, shall mata. Actually, I think I might have mentioned this once before, but in this context, it's important to mention it again. And that is something about the word Yerushalayim. The word Yerushalayim, I think I mentioned in this share, I'm not sure, that it's interesting in the Hebrew language, that the Hebrew language has a unique feature, that it's got a special grammatical form, apart from having, having as all languages have, a way of expressing the singular and the plural. It also has another form which, which expresses the idea of a pair, a pair of things that work together. So for example, in Hebrew, we speak about a nayim, we don't mean lots of eyes, we mean a pair of eyes. Oznayim, raglayim, the ayim end means a pair. For example, misparayim, misparayim means a scissors, which only works when you have two blades working together, or michnasayim. A trousers, right? I've got two legs. You only have the ayim format in, in Loshan HaKodesh is a unique expression of a pair that work together and only really work properly, fully, when they are uh, uh, in sync, in, in sync with each other, right? They are in harmony with each other. And that's the inayim, oznayim, etc., etc., etc. So what about Yerushalayim? Why is Yerushalayim got that ayim grammatical form? So Teisva says the reason is because there is Yerushalayim shel mala and Yerushalayim shel mat. There is a physical Yerushalayim and there is another Yerushalayim, which is, is Yerushalayim shel mala in the transcendent Olam Ho'elia, in the world of the Ein Seif, there is also, in some sense, of course, we're getting into the world of Kabbalah and mysticism, which is not my subject, um, but it is, but I'm only mentioning it because it's in the Gemara and Taina stuff, hey, which I just quoted to you, the Gemara says, right, that when David HaMelech said, Ke'ir shechubro lo yachtov, what did he mean, yachtov? He meant that the Yerushalayim shall mala and Yerushalayim shall mata will be united, right? And in actual fact, 
part of the work that Klal Yisrael has in every generation is to try and bridge that gap a little bit, if you like, between the ideal Yerushalayim and the real Yerushalayim. The ideal is still a concept which has not yet manifested itself in this world, but it will one day. And the idea of Yerushalayim HaBenuyah is Shechubro Lo Yachtov, that it will connect together the, the Yerushalayim Shel Mala, which is a place of Ruchnius, and Yerushalayim Shel Mata. And that's the... So this Gemara says, Omar Rabbi Yochanan, so he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Lo Ovoi Yerushalayim Shel Mala. I'm not going to enter into the upper Yerushalayim until I enter into the lower Yerushalayim. What is being said here exactly is somewhat a bit mysterious, but it means in some sense that so long as Klal Yisrael are in Golos, Kaviyochol, it's as if HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself is in some self-imposed Golos, right? And in fact, the Zoya speaks in a few places about Shechinto Begolusa, that when you daven for the Geula, you're not just davening for our redemption, but in some mystical way, which is not easy to understand, the Shekhinah itself is in Golas, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has sworn that he won't uh, feel a, that, he, that his, his intentions have been completely realized until we come into Yerushalayim Shamata. And then the Gemara says, oh, me ikya Yerushalayim lamala. how do you know? That there is an upper Yerushalayim, asked the Gemara. So the Gemara answers in. And this is one of the confusing words, incidentally, for beginners in Gemara. The word Aleph Yud Nun, right? Because in Hebrew, Ein is a negative. It means nothing. It means not. And in Aramaic, In, Aleph Yud Nun, means yes. It means exactly the opposite, right? It's one of those tricky, it's one of those trick words you have to get hold of when you first start learning Gemara that in means exactly the opposite of what it means in Hebrew. So in means yes. How do we know there is? Because the Pesach says, Yerushalayim habanuyo ke'ir shechubro lo yachtov. Our Pesach in Tehillim, says the Gemara, is an indication that Yerushalayim is, is chubro yachtov, is connecting two things together. And what, are being, what is being connected? The upper and lower Yerushalayim. So we have now a second pshat. The first pshat and chubur lo yachtov was it unites the whole of Klal Yisrael together when they come on Aliyah, Lerega, and they're able, able to overcome their hostilities and their differences and live together ki'ish echod, belev echod, as we're going to say, please God, and, and Shavuos, right? That's the famous Rashi on Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Hahar, that at Matan Teira, Klal Yisrael were united, says Rashi, ke'ish echod belev echod, a rare moment indeed in Jewish history. Uh, but what, what David Amalek is saying, that Yerushalayim HaBenuyah has the power to do that always. That the, the existence of Yerushalayim HaBenuyah is to create ke'ish echod belev echod. That's the first pshat. And the second pshat is this Gemara in Tainus, which says that it's to, to unite together the... Um, Yerushalayim shall mala and Yerushalayim shall mata, the spiritual and physical world. Um, okay, so here is a, a th- maybe a third, a third pshat. Let me, let me, maybe let's go here to this. Let, let's have a look at this. A, th- a third pshat is the 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 perush of 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 Yemos Hamashiach, right? Don't forget, David Melech wasn't speaking about Moshiach. He was speaking about building the base of Mikdash. But Yeshaya Hanavi speaks about Mashiach, the, the ultimate goal of, of, of history, the ultimate goal of mankind. So but Yeshaya in chapter two says something, says something amazing. And we are familiar, again, only with one little half a posuk from this bit of Yeshaya. The posuk, the bit we're familiar with, we're going to see in a second, is Ki Mitzion Teitze Torah. Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim, again, because it's a song, and because we say it in, 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 in our Tfilas, it, it's become famous. But actually, what is the context of that phrase? So have a look at this. Let's learn together four psukim from Yeshaya. Chapter two. Again, if you have a chance to look at it inside, do so. Hadova Asher Choza Yeshaya Ben Omotz and Yehuda Yerushalayim. These are the words that Yeshaya prophesied 
concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim means this was his vision for Achris Hayomim for Yerusha Mashiach. So he says as follows, look at this. It will be at the end of days, right? Achris Hayomim again is a, is a code word for the Messianic era. What's going to be? that the base of Mikdash will be Nachon, will be firmly built, right, at the, at the top of the mountain, right, the Nisa Migvos, and it will be raised up on the top of the hill, okay, so far so good, so that we knew already, but now Yeshaya gives us an interesting and a very important facet of Yemosa Mashiach, and, and that is, look at this, the Noharu, the Noharu Elov Kol Hagoyim, and the nations will all be. So he translates here. I'm just noticed here that this is a wrong translation. Yes. The nations yes. shall gaze. I don't know why he translates it here. Can you see here? This is the English translation of Safaria, which I must warn you all is, is often incorrect. The nations shall gaze on it with joy. The Noharu Elov means something else completely. Mm. Noharu comes from the word Nahar. It's, it's a, a, a river. In other words, all the nations will flow like a river to Yerushalayim. In other words, it will attract the nations of the world like a magnet. The Noharu Elov Kalagayim. The nations will come or will want to come en masse. And what's going to happen? So he says, Vaholcha, look at this pasuk here, a most remarkable pasuk of Yeshaya's prediction of, of messianic times. Vaholchu amim rabim, and many people will come together, they will say, Vaomru, they will say, we must go to the base Hashem in Yerushalayim, el base eloke Yaakov, to the house of Yaakov. And, and why, why, why do you want to go there? Look at this. The Yerenu Midracha, that he will be able to instruct us, to teach us. Yerenu comes from the word uh, Moreh, which is a teacher, or Hora'a. In fact, the word, the word Torah itself means teachings. Right? The Yerenu Midracha, that we can learn the ways of life, the values of life, the morality of life. In other words, Yeshaya is referring to the universal message of the Torah. The Torah contains different levels of messages, right? Its primary message is to Klal Yisrael, to live a life of Avodah Hashem. But it also has a message to mankind. There is a universal message. And be most of Mashiach, they will say, be yarenu let it, we, we want to learn from his ways. And we will be able to walk in its path. In other words, the nations of the world will want to learn morality and values and the philosophy and the perspective and, and the understanding of life, which will be taught the Mos Mashiach, which will come out of Yerushalayim. And here comes our favorite puzzle. Ki mitzion teitze Torah or dvar Hashem Yerushalayim. Because Torah comes from Zion and Yerushalayim. So here you have an amazing idea that actually Shishaya HaMelech is giving us in terms of our share today, it's the third interpretation of Shechubro Lo Yachtov. The first one was to unite the Jewish people internally. The second one was to unite the Yerushalayim Shammata and Yerushalayim Shammala. The third shot is it will unite mankind. It will unite all the peoples of the world will come together and they, they will be able to raise themselves above all their hostilities and differences and their fighting and their war, the wars they have with each other. And, and now comes the fourth and final posse that we're looking at today. The Shofat Bein Hagoyim, that the Mashiach will be able to judge. He will teach and he will judge and he will arbitrate and he will give instruction to all the nations, right? Lamim Rabim. And here comes a famous pasuk, which if I'm not mistaken, is written on, on the wall of the outside of the United Nations. One of the most extraordinary things, the United Nations, which sadly has become a, a format for hatred of Israel over the years, but on the outside of the building is written this phrase, the chitetu charvosom le'itim, 
they will beat their swords into plowshares. Or the mizmoras for the yisogoy el goy chirev the yild mudu o milchama. Yeshaya Hanavi, right over two and a half thousand years ago, was the first person, to my knowledge, in the whole of mankind, to say there is a vision that it is possible that the whole world will live together in peace with each other, and they won't need any more, any tanks and rockets and guns. There won't, there'll be no need for that anymore at all. They'll melt all that down and they'll use it for plowshares. Many of the, in other words, if you want to translate this posuk into modern economics, what does it mean they'll beat their swords into plowshares? It means if you can imagine every nation in the world taking all the money that they spend on defense and using it for education and welfare and, 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 uh, and health and the well-being of their nation and not spending any money on, 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 on any uh, uh, tanks or, or warships or, or, or fighter planes or anything like that. All that money will be spent on the well-being of mankind. That is Yemosa Moshiach. To beat their, their swords into plowshares means to, build, to beat their aircraft carriers into welfare programs and educational programs and tzedakah to look after everybody. And to, therefore, within the world, once the hostilities has been removed, the world has enough resources to look after everybody. There doesn't need to be any poverty or ill health at all. It's only because there is milchama in the world. That is what will be... Resolved. So that is the ultimate... Uh, a level of of chubro lo yachtov to join together all the nations of the world, and that's Yerushalayim. So Yerushalayim has all these. <laughs> so Yerushalayim has just to summarize, right? David Hamelach wants desperately to give us not just Yerushalayim, but Yerushalayim Habenuya. For various reasons, he wasn't allowed to, but he still has the vision. He knows what Yerushalayim HaBenuyah can do to the world, right? And it's interesting that when Shlomo HaMelech does build the base of Mikdash, if you look at the Psukim in Melachim Aleph, you'll see that V'noharu Eilav Kol HaGoyim, but the nations of the world did, they flocked to him to hear his wisdom. And in fact, the Mephoshim say that both Mishle and Koheles were written as a result of lectures or ideas or speeches that Shlomo HaMelech gave to all the people who came to him in search of wisdom, in search of knowledge, in search of understanding properly the values of life or the purpose of life and, and how, to, how to run their nation. The reason why he, he brought together the uh, um, people who read the story of Shlomo HaMelech often don't understand what he's doing because we have to, we try always to look at uh, ancient history as if it's happening today. So when you hear about Shlomo HaMelech having a thousand wives, you think, gosh, that's a lunacy. That's an absolute lunacy. What you don't understand really is that in the ancient world, the, the classic way of any king to form alliances with other nations and other tribes was to marry a daughter of the leader of the other tribe and therefore, and, and that was the way to, to create alliances. And that's why he was interested in, 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 the, women, in, in, in the daughters of the king of Egypt and the king of, of, of Persia and the king of... He wanted to, he, he married those women, not because he was short of, of women in his life, but because that was, all those nations wanted a Keshe with him. They wanted a connection with him. They wanted to learn from him and be inspired by him. And indeed, when Shlomo HaMelech builds the Beis HaMikdash in Malachim Aleph, chapter 8, he makes a speech. And in the speech, he's very careful to say that this Beis HaMikdash is, is designed as being the spiritual center of the Jewish people. But every God-fearing non-Jew in the world is welcome to come here. He welcomes every God-fearing non-Jew into the Beis HaMikdash to come here and delve into HaKadosh Baruch and to be inspired and to learn. He welcomes the Umot HaOlam. Shlomo HaMelech has a universal message. 
And that universal message is connected to Yerushalayim. And his, his father, David HaMelech, understood already that when Yerushalayim HaBenuyo will become a reality, then it will have the impact of, uh, it will have an impact on the whole of mankind. So not only will it have the power to unite Klal Yisrael, for us that's a dream. Imagine having a Jewish people who are, who are not fighting with each other all the time. Imagine that. I, I personally can't imagine that. Uh, it, 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 it's such a stretch of the imagination. And, and sadly, in the world in which we live today, um, every additional uh, election in this country is yet another opportunity for hostilities and besmirching and fighting and negativity towards other people. And it's just so heartbreaking that we can't, that people can't get together simply out of hatred and egos. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's, the the Klalis will have difficulty uniting, even when they know, even when we know we have to unite. As I say, that's not to say that everybody can't have their own ideas and opinions, etc. but to be able to recognize the, the greater good for Am Yisrael, uh, which, which transcends personal animosities and hostilities and egos, that is something which sadly we haven't got there yet. But what I wanted to show you today, today being Isru Chag Yom Yerushalayim, the day after Yom Yerushalayim, a day in which sadly we're in the middle of a battle with people who want to destroy us and who want to fight against us. But HaKadosh Baruch who gave us this gift 54 years ago, and the same Malachim that gave us that gift 54 years ago will continue to protect us against those people who want to destroy Yerushalayim, that same Hashkacha. And, and uh, that is really some of the thoughts we should take away for, for ourselves on Yom Yerushalayim, that it is potentially a place of unity for Klal Yisrael, a place of bringing together the spiritual and the physical worlds and a place of, of uniting mankind around a system of values and morality and belief. And that is Yimos Mashiach. And that's all Yerushalayim Habnuyo Ke'ir Shechubro La Yachtov. So next time you open your Tehillim, pick out Tehillim Kuf Kaf Beis, chapter 122, and read it carefully. That is the Mizmo Tehillim you should say every time you come to the Kaisal, every time you come to the Harabayas, every time you celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, that's the Mizmo. That's David HaMelech's Tefillah, that's his Nevoah, and, and that is really the, the vision that Yeshaya picked up and spelt it out for us a, a, a bit more clearly. So, ladies and gentlemen, there, there is actually just one last dimension of Yerushalayim to mention, uh, which we are familiar with from Yaakov Ovinu. And this is maybe the fourth and final pshat for today on Yerushalayim Habenuya. So Yaakov Ovinu, as you all know, in the beginning of Vayetze, had, I'll just finish off with this last idea. In the beginning of Vayetze, he has the dream of the Malachim going up and down, and then multiple interpretations given to that dream. But when he wakes up, he says, says, this place is not an ordinary place. This place, and this is the Harabayas where he's standing, this place, and he gives it a new name, a name which has been adopted by many different shuls around the world, the, the word Sha'ar HaShamayim, the gate of heaven. What does it mean, the gate of heaven? So on a halachic practical level, it means that it doesn't matter where you are on planet Earth, when you stand to Davin, you face Yerushalayim. Why do you face Yerushalayim? Because Yaakov Avinu said, which means that in some mystical sense, all our tefillas connect to our Kaddish Baruch Hu through Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is the conduit which somehow funnels all the tefillas of all of Klal Yisrael, Basher Shom, wherever they are, to the Shemaim, to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, to the heavens. And in fact, that is the simple pshat in the Malachim going up and down. The Malachim going up are the tefillas of Klal Yisrael. The prayers that we, that we engage in daily and every moment we down to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, those tefillas are the Malachim going up and the Malachim coming down is the response uh, to, to those uh, 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 to those tefillas. So the Shar HaShamayim is the Beis HaMikdash, 
is the Kodesh Kadoshin, is the moment of the, the point of contact between the Olam Ha'elyon and the Olam Ha'tachton. So therefore, the Chubro Lo Yachtov is not just a vision for Yemosa Mashiach, it's a, it's, it's a thought which should accompany us uh, every time we daven. Whenever we daven, we face Yerushalayim, and we think, ah, Yerushalayim is the Sha'ar HaShamayim, it's the place which, so what is the Chibur here? It's a Chibur between me and the Rebbein Shlam. The personal connection that every man and woman has with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, every day and every breath of our life and every moment of our lives, that Chibur is through Yerush- Yerushalayim is that Chibur, is that connection like sort of an umbilical cord connecting this world with the Olam Ho'elion, and that is the Zeh Shara Shabbat. And that is the beauty of the unity of Yerushalayim. And all these ideas are expressed by David HaMelech uh, in this Mizmar very beautifully. Ke'ir she'chubro lo yachto. Joins out everyone together as Chaveirim. It joins out Tfilas Tarkarish Baruch Hu, and ultimately it joins the nations of the world to each other without hatred and and all of them are connected to each other through their emunah and akarish baruchu and and kibitzian teite teira of var hashem yerushalayim that is the beautiful vision uh, of, of what yerushalayim will one day be in the meantime ladies and gentlemen yerushalayim hasn't quite got there yet uh, so it's our challenge really everybody in their own little way everybody can would one milli- add one millimeter of drawing Yerushalayim that little bit closer to its ultimate destiny by trying in some way to promote the Kesher with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Kesher uh, um, that we have with each other, right? And trying to create that Achdus, Chubro Lo Yachtov, the Achdus, the unity which Yerushalayim contains is something we can all uh, plug into and uh, to be able to live in Yerushalayim and visit Yerushalayim and benefit from Yerushalayim is the most amazing possible gift that we could have received. And as I said, we had a little bit of help from the hatred of Nasa and the ego of Hussein and the lunacy of our enemies. HaKadosh Baruch has helped us uh, once again to get back to Yerushalayim in the most unexpected way possible. Uh, and Yerotzen, that we should be able to see Yerushalayim Habanuyah uh, in the not too distant future. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi, as always. A great pleasure yeah. to see you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. In these difficult times, it's important to remain positive and remain focused and to know that Akarish Baruch has given us a line for a good reason and we will we will be Zecha, please God, to use it fully in the not too distant future. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Rabbi.